You are listening to a sermon preached at Still Bay Baptist Church in Still Bay, South Africa. For more information, please visit our website stillbaybaptist.co.za. May you be blessed in listening to God's Word today. Now, I want you to have a good look at yourself and to realize that I really prayed that God will bring everyone here today who needs to hear this message. And specifically, if you don't often come to this church and you wonder why you ended up here today, that is definitely not by chance. Um, I pray that God will bring people here because today we're talking about a a very controversial topic today. Um, But you're not allowed to fight with me because it's my birthday. So that's that's the good thing. Um, The topic for today is a call for unity about the nation Israel. Now the most important part of that topic is the first part, a call for unity as we speak about Israel. Now I want to say right from the beginning, this is not going to be a political talk. We're not going to talk about 7 October and what happened there and what should have happened and what shouldn't have happened, um, whether the retaliation should have happened, whether it should have happened in the way it did. This is not a discussion of how much of the land should belong to Palestine. This is a biblical discussion because any opinion I have about anything is vastly unimportant when it comes to what God says in His Word. And all we want to look at today is this question. Is the nation Israel today the people or the nation of God. So there's a country there, up in the Middle East. Are they, when we talk about them, do we say, oh, there's the nation of God, there's the people of God, or are they not? Today is not to say, I'm for that one, let's fight. This is not the goal. Or even worse, and it grieves me now when I hear this, when you turn to the side who disagrees with you and you curse them, or you condemn them as less of a Christian. Well, one day you'll get to the level I am and know things like I do. What arrogance we often show. And how often we get, break God's greatest command um, to love other people for our opinions. And we shoot people down because they don't agree with us. Um, so what I want to show you today is based on this question. In the church... That's, now I'm talking about the real church. I'm talking about born again, spirit filled, um, Jesus following, Christ centered, godly, Bible believing. In that group of people, you will have people that would say yes, and you will have people that would say no. And the goal for today is to understand that that's fine. We have to come together and understand that. Um, as a Baptist, we are fine whether you answer yes or no. One thing I love about the Baptist is that we center around the most important truths. We don't avoid all difficult topics because we don't want to offend anyone. No, person's not going to like it if I say that, so I won't say that. There are some cardinal primary truths that the Baptists stand on and we will never budge from it. So if you go to our assemblies, some of these topics will never be dealt with. Never, ever, because that's what it means to be a Baptist. Now, the first thing is that we believe Jesus is God. It's never going to be debated. We believe that Jesus is the only way to be saved. We believe that you are saved by faith alone. We believe that the Bible is the inspired, inerrant Word of God, and no other book or person or prophecy can ever come closely to that. We believe that Jesus is coming again. We believe that He rose from the dead. We believe that there's eternal blessing, eternal life for those who follow Him and accept Him, and that there's eternal punishment in the lake of fire for those who reject Him. These things are not up for debate. Um, there are many churches who debate, is really hell, does hell exist? We will never have that debate. Another thing we stand firmly on is that marriage is between a natural man and a natural woman. And people go, oh, that's not such a big one. Of course we can disagree on that one. No. For the simple reason that it's such an important truth that God established it in the first two chapters of the Bible. And the whole Bible, one of the stories of the Bible, is how bad life and society gets when you break that. It's easy to say, oh yeah, but in the Bible, they didn't always stick to that rule. There were all these guys with their many wives. 
Surely God is a bit more loose on the idea of marriage. There's not a single example in the Bible that you're going to find where these marriages are put in a good light. There's never when there's a guy with many wives and they all lived happily ever after. It's always a Barney. There's always a fight. Because it's not God's way. We believe the Bible is clear enough on this that we don't have to debate it. But there are many, many things where there's freedom to disagree. Now, I want to say this. You are not allowed an opinion. Drink water for effect. It wasn't in my notes. You are not allowed an opinion because opinions mean nothing. You're allowed an interpretation of the Bible. That's what matters. What you say, what you believe, has to come from the Bible. You have to say, I hold to this view because the Bible says this. Not I hold to that view because that's what my parents said, or this is what works for me, or this is what, or this is what I feel internally. Well, I think this is how God made me. How you feel God made you can never overwrite the word. It stands as its truth. Okay, so things that we disagree on, whether people still speak in tongues or not about the end time. Is there going to be a rapture before, pre-trip, mid-trip, post-trip? Is it going to be a literal thousand years or not a literal thousand years? Um, all these things that we allow disagreement on, but we center around <clears throat> the greatest law. Love God, love others, and the greatest command, make disciples of all nations. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at this question, and I'm going to explain, explain both parts both sides for you, and I'm going to show you the verses that each side use to say, but this is my interpretation. Um, again, my primary goal today is not even to change your mind. If God's primary goal today through His Word is to change your mind, then that's wonderful. My primary goal is for you to understand there are people who disagree with me on this, and it's fine. I must love them. I must honor them. I must accept them. Okay, so that's the thing. Then what we're going to do is, in both of these views, we're going to look at some of the danger areas. When do you go too far with this view? When does your opinion or your understanding of this view step outside of the Bible? When does your holding of this view step outside of the Bible? Um, and then we're going to end by saying again, we are not here to fight about these things. We are not here to be such narrow-minded Christians that the tiniest thing that you disagree with me on, I throw you out. I don't want to have church with you. I don't want to do anything to do with you. The people with these narrow-minded normally don't go to church because everyone disagrees with them on something so they can't coexist with him. And they're looking for this church that 100% agrees with them and they just can't seem to find it. And then often they just start their own church with them and maybe three other family members. Okay, so this is where we are going today, and may God speak, not Carl J. So let's pray together. Yes, Lord, I so often wonder why there are so many things we disagree on. And Lord, what strikes me is that it's not new. Even at the establishment of the church, there were things that people disagreed on and went separate ways and, and had debates on and letters had to be written. Lord, as Paul writes in Romans, and, and he says, it's fine. It's fine if you disagree on whether to keep the Sabbath or not. It's fine if you disagree on the food laws. Get back to the Master. Get back to Jesus. Get back to the center of it all. And so, Lord, help us to understand where it's fine to disagree, where not, and to walk in love, fulfilling the Great Commission to make disciples of all nations. Lord, that's our prayer, that you will guide us in this. We pray this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so the first view that we have <clears throat> is this view. Israel is the people, nation of God, but the church is too. And the second view is Israel is no longer the people, nation of God, but they can join the nation of God. They can become the nation of God. So whenever we talk today about Israel, we're talking about that, that group of people living there in the land, Israel. Um, now the first group is this one that says, Israel is the people and nation of God. I want to try to explain each view for you, but what makes it difficult is that there's a lot of nuances in a group. 
So I might say something and you go, oh, I'm in this group, but I don't really agree with that. So I'm trying to stick to the basics of what the group is about. Okay, so this group, um, it's, a held, it's a view held very strongly by anyone holding to the dispensationalist view. Those are the people who believe that there's a pre-trip rapture and a thousand years and the church are taken away and all those type of things. That's, but it's not just them. There are people who don't accept the dispensationalist view that would also be in this camp. And their basic view is this. When you start to read the Bible, you find that there's a covenant that was made with the nation Israel. God calls them, He creates this nation Israel, and He tells them, I will be your God, and you will be my people, and it's an eternal covenant. It's, and the current living nation of Israel are the inheritors of this covenant. Therefore, they are God's nation, God's people, and therefore the church needs to support them. We need to be pro-Israel, we need to be for Israel, because they are God's people of this covenant. Okay, that's the one view. I'm going to look at some verses here. 2 Samuel 7.23 And who is like your people, Israel? Who is like your people, Israel? The one nation on earth whom God went to redeem to be His people, making Himself a name and doing for them great and awesome things by driving out before your people, whom you redeemed for yourself from Egypt, a nation and its gods. And you established for yourself your people, Israel, to be your people forever. And you, O Lord, became their God. Not just Old Testament. Let's look at New Testament. I ask then, has God rejected His people? And if you read Romans, this is talking about the nation Israel. By no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abram, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected His people whom He foreknew. Now that seems like a done deal. Seems like we can pray, thank you very much, let's go home. It seems very clear. And so the people who hold this view, hold this view often very strongly. That the Bible is very clear, this is what it is. Um, but let's look at the other view now. Now the other view says, Israel is no longer the people of, or nation of God, but they could join the people of God. They could join the nation. So the basic view goes like this. In the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament... God made a covenant with Israel and He chose them as a nation to eventually be a blessing to the whole world. But that old covenant no longer stands. Not because because God broke His covenants, but because the old covenant was replaced by a better covenant. Um, He brought in a better covenant. And the one way someone explained it, and I think it's very helpful, is He said, If your dad comes to you and he says, when you turn 18, I'm going to buy you a bicycle. And you go, that's great. And you can't wait for that day when you turn 18 to get your bicycle. And on the morning of your 18th birthday, your dad wakes you up and he says, come look outside. And he takes you outside. And as you open the door, you see it there. A brand new car. Are you going to go... Where's my bicycle? (laughs) You promised me a bicycle. Do you understand? Did that dad break his promise of giving a bicycle? He replaced it with something better. Did he harm his child by lying to him? No. He had a plan and then he made a better plan and it's good. And this is an understanding of the old covenant. The old covenant was always to be replaced by a better covenant, the new covenant. And now again, it's not that Israel is the old covenant and they are thrown out and now we have a new covenant with the church because who was first invited into the new covenant? The Jews. He came to them and says, here's the better way. You you know it's written, but I say to you. And so the Jews were the first beneficiaries of this covenant and eventually the Gentiles were brought in as well. And so under the new covenant, this group would say, the people of God has got nothing to do with an ethnic race or a group of people, or a nation of people. The people of God is the church. The people of God are those who bend the knee to Jesus and accept Him. Is Israel included? No. 
they actually have a better opportunity because they heard it first. Because they have a whole history of the patriarchs that allows them to understand it better. They have a better chance than anyone else to get into this covenant. But it's the people of God, the church. Did God give up on Israel? No. True Israel accepted Jesus. False Israel fell away. And so this group would say the current nation Israel is by and large not God's people. They are mostly a secular nation that don't believe in any God that is real. Now people go, oh, no, they have the Father, they have the Holy Spirit, they might not have Jesus, but two out of three are still a pass. What did Jesus say? He said, if you knew the Father, you would accept me. Rejecting me shows you don't know the Father. There's no such thing as someone who worships the Father but not Jesus. You worship a false God. You worship a God of your imaginations. And so this group says, no. Um, now again, this group doesn't hate Israel. They're not anti-Israel. They're not against Israel. They just say the old covenant was replaced by the new covenant. Now, I'm going to look at some verses. Ho I can never say this word. Hosea. Is that right? Hosea? I'm getting there. Okay. I want to say Hosea, but that's Afrikaans and you won't understand what I'm saying. Okay. Hosea says, and the Lord said, Hosea 1 verse 9, and the Lord said, call his name not my people, lo ami, for you are not my people and I am not your God. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, children of the living God. The second part of that verse is amazing. Because it says God is coming to, going to a place where there are people who are not his people. And he's going to say, I'm pulling you in to become children of the living God. Now, irrespective if you think when and how and where, there's one point when God turned to a group, if not the whole nation of Israel, and said, you are not my people, and I am not your God. Um, you might just jump up now and say, well, that's not how I understand the verse. And that's the whole problem with these things. Whenever we dealt with a controversial thing like this, you end up normally, if you study the Bible a lot, you end up in one of the camps. And what do you then do with the verses that seem to not exactly say what you want to say? You find ways to make them say what you want them to say. Um, and so this is what we have to be very careful of. We have to come to the text and say what says the text. This text says God turned to his people at one point and he said, Now you are not my people. Um, Okay, so now this is extended into the New Testament. John 1, 11, 13 says, He came to his own, referring to the nation Israel, and his own people did not receive him. But, so, differently, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. There's a crowd called the children of God and it's got nothing to do with what blood or flesh you have. So Jesus, like this group then says, is Jesus comes and he brings a new covenant. And Hebrews 8.13 says, in speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Why is it not vanished away at the point when this writer is writing Hebrews? Because it vanished away when all the Jews had a chance to hear about Jesus. Then it vanished away. Because the old covenant was when you didn't know about Jesus yet, it stood until you know about Jesus. Then it falls away and it vanishes away. Now I'm going to look at a parable, and there are many of these parables you can go read. We're going to look at one of them. Matthew 21, 33 says, Here another parable. Now, He's going to tell you in the end what he's referring to. But I'm going to see if you can pick up so long what he is referring to. Here another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent another servant, more than the first, 
and they did the same to him. So who's the master of the house here? God. That's, that's a simple one. So who are the tenants? Not us. Israel. He put a fence. He gathered them and made them the nation. And when the season for fruit draw near, so what fruit would the master require of Israel? Worship, faith, obedience. And they didn't do it. Every time the prophets came and said, why are you turning your back on God? Repent and turn to God. And what did they do with those prophets? They rejected them. They stoned them. That's the picture here. Okay. We read on in verse 37. Finally, he sent his son to them saying, they will respect my son. But when a tenant saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Who's the son? Jesus. Who threw him out? Who killed him? When Jesus stands before Pilate, there's a comment made where Pilate said he realized the people are rejecting Jesus because they want the power. We want kill, have inheritance. And they took him and they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Verse 40. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? Now he asked the, pro the Pharisees and the leaders there, what is he going to do? Now listen to their answer. They say to them, He will put out those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruit in their seasons. They themselves admit this is a horrible picture. Those guys don't deserve to be there. Chuck them out. Jesus said to them, Have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes. Why that quote? Jesus is saying, don't you know? I'm coming as a new cornerstone. Poof. And you either build on me or you don't build at all. I'm the cornerstone of God's new building. And we're going to read later what happens to those who reject it. Verse 43. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the, so when is that referring to? This idea, the previous part of when the master returns. It can't be the first coming. It has to be the events leading up to the second coming. Okay. Um, so this kingdom will be taken away from you people. It will be given to someone else. And what will happen to you? You will be crushed by Jesus. Um, now, what some people say is, yeah, yeah, yeah but remember, he's, he's speaking to the priests and the Pharisees. He's not talking to the nation of Israel. No, you missed the whole parable. The parable is about the nation that did this wrong. Was only the priests and the Pharisees guilty of this? The whole nation. And he said, it will be taken away from you and given to a nation. He's talking about nations at the moment. So then they want to arrest him. What crime did they think he was guilty of? Anti-Semitism. How dare you speak against Israel? How dare you say these things about us? We will arrest you. Um, okay, then that's verse 46. Now, what then about... Now you, you might come to this group now and say, okay, that's good. But what about the passages that Paul speaks about to say God is not done with them? What about Romans 11? Has God rejected his people? Listen what Paul says. By no means, and his reason is because I'm God's people and I'm an Israelite. So does he include himself in God's people because he's an Israelite? No, because he was saved by Jesus. And it comes back to the whole point is the old covenant, the new covenant isn't anti-Jew. It isn't anti-Israel. It was given to Israel first. And they could accept it. Um, but Paul says, it's Jesus. Now the same Paul said this 
If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Now listen to his pedigree. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. What does the term a Hebrew of Hebrews mean? I keep the law. I live like a Jew should live. I do it all. Then we jump a bit in this. He's just talking about all the good things he does as a Jew or did as a Jew. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake, I suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. He says, I look at all these Jewish things. And he, um, Bible translators are very gentle people with good manners. And so they say, I count it as rubbish. That word is the word for human excrement. I count it as dung. All, all this Israel and Hebrew of Hebrews, I count it as dung compared to knowing Jesus. Compared to knowing Him and following Him. Okay, so now those are the two views. I labored a bit more on the second one because I think there are more people of the first group in this church. And so I don't have to convince you of the first group, but I have to convince you that the second group exists. Okay, so now let's look at some of the danger areas. What's the danger areas for the people who say um, Israel is the nation of God? And remember, you're allowed to say that. Today is not a pick your side and hit the other side. Today is... Understand my side and watch out for the danger areas and love the other side. That's what we're going for. Danger area number one. Believing Israel can be saved without Jesus. This is definitely not true for most people in this group, I would say. Especially not in the church context. But there's a danger in this group that you become so enamored with Israel that you think God is going to accept them. I've had people that joined our church was very upset when I said, when a Jew dies without Jesus, they're going to hell. I think the Bible makes it very clear. But there's a, so there's a danger here. Now, there's a very famous guy, Pastor John Hagee, that said this, The law of Moses is sufficient enough to bring a person into the knowledge of God until God gives him a greater revelation. Everyone else, whether Buddhist or Baha'i, needs to believe in Jesus, but not Jews. So John Hagee says you can be saved without Jesus if you're a Jew. Now, this is so shocking because it's so easy to show that he's wrong. We just have to go to Romans 9 where Paul says, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bear me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. <clears throat> for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ." For the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Romans 10 verse 1. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Paul looked at the nation of Israel and he says, Jesus, send me to hell so they can be saved. Lord, save them. And John Hagee phones Paul and says, don't worry Paul, they're saved. What's your problem? Jews need Jesus. Why does he have some anguish? Because he saw them dying and going to eternal destruction for rejecting Jesus. Okay. Now just to clarify, because you might wonder about this. Before Jesus came and the old covenant were there, you could be saved without knowing the name of Jesus. Because it wasn't revealed yet. And the old covenant before Jesus came looked forward to the Messiah they looked forward to Jesus coming so that when Jesus pitched up, they say, He's here, and they accepted Him. That's Jesus' whole message. If you knew the Father, you would accept me. True Israel, true Old Covenant Israel, accepted Jesus when He came. But now in the New Covenant, everyone, including Jews, needs to be look back at Jesus' death and resurrection and say, there's my only hope for salvation. Jews need Jesus. They need to be evangelized. Now, there's an interesting thing in the Bible. We don't have time to go into the detail of it. But it says, the church needs to enjoy God so much that the Jews get jealous. We need to be so fully in what it means to be the people of God that Israel goes and says, but what do they have that we don't have? And it brings them to the knees and accept Jesus. Okay, that's the first danger. The second danger Believing we have always have to support and agree with the nation Israel. 
now I'm stepping on toes. Because the videos are going around, churches for Israel, and the flags are waving. Now, again, on a secular level, Israel is by and large a light beam in that area. In terms of human rights, in terms of freedoms, in terms of all those type of things, compared to the darkened Muslim worldview countries around them, the oppression of women and other religions, Israel is a beam of light on a secular and a humanistic level. But does that mean the church must always support Israel as a nation? My answer is no, and I'm going to show you biblically why. You know, people go to this verse and they say, from Genesis 12, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Who's he talking to? Abram. Now again, so there's a there's an argument to be made that he's not even referring to the nation of Israel, but he's referring to believers as the father of all believers. But let's assume he's talking about Israel. Let's even more assume that he's talking about the nation Israel that's currently living there. Now it says, if you bless them, you will be blessed. If you curse them, you will be cursed. When I, when I sat with the sermon, I realized it's not true of everyone, but many people support Israel out of purely selfish motives. I want to be blessed. Oh, here's the one that tells me how I can be blessed. I better support Israel. No clue what's going on, but I don't want to be cursed. And so let me do this thing. Now, what I want to go in, in is this idea of asking, what does it mean to bless? Does bless mean I support everything you do? I agree with everything you do. I'm not allowed to speak out against you. I'm not allowed to tell you when you're wrong. Is that what bless means? If that is what bless means, every single prophet in the Old Testament is cursed. If that is what bless means, Paul is cursed. If that is what bless means, Jesus is cursed. Bless has never and will never mean I agree with everything you do and I praise you and honor you for whatever you do. It means I pray God's best on you. The best blessing you can give Israel is I pray that you will repent and fall on your knees and accept Jesus and have him as your Messiah. That's how you bless Israel. Now, um, can the church speak out if Israel makes mistakes? Absolutely. We should. And you know why we should? Not because of arrogance. The Bible makes it very clear. Please don't be more arrogant because you are not Israel. We have to speak out because we know more truth than they do. We have more light than they do. They do things that are wrong because they don't know God's revelation in the New Testament and we have to tell them that. Um, so now, this is my only bit of politics. It's going to be that long. Okay. Can you, as a church person, agree that Israel had the right to attack Gaza after 7 October in spite of so many children being killed because that's how Hamas chooses to fight the war? Yes. Can you, as a Christian, say, I think Israel needs to find another way to fight this war so that so many innocent people aren't killed? You can have that view. And you can speak out that view. Okay. I think it's unbiblical to always support Israel no ma matter what. Because of our measurement of truth and right is not Israel. It's God and the Bible. And so we praise God for good things happening in Israel. We fall on our knees when we hear about people being saved in Israel. We are thankful for every good thing Israel does to protect people. Everything they do to get their um, kidnapped hostages back. We praise God for that. But they are not our measurement of truth. <coughs> so I get nervous when people say, I'm pro-Israel. Because you have to define what you mean by it. You have to. Okay. That's the danger on this group. Let's look at the danger on the other side. People who say it's no longer the people of God. The first danger there is that you believe God is done with Israel. <coughs> so this belief is, well, they messed up. They had their chance. They didn't want to accept Jesus. And God says, wash my hands. 
I'm done with you. You don't ever get a chance again. Now I'm just focusing on the nations and the Gentiles. Now, you might think that's a very strange view. Who would have a view like that? Martin Luther was driven by this view. Martin Luther hated the Jews with a passion. Good Martin Luther, who saved us from the Catholic Church, he was driven by hatred for the Jews. In a sick, twisted way, this became the reason why Hitler could justify killing all the Jews. Because we can hate them. They're the enemies of God. And so, why is this wrong? Well, not even, never mind prophecy. Because this is the era of grace where everyone still has a chance to be saved. God has written, no one has been written off. Um, but when it comes to prophecy, and now I'm going to say, <coughs> yes, some people even disagree with me. There are people in the church that says, no, I'm a preterist. Israel is done. There is never going to be anything about Israel anymore. I don't agree with them, but I think they love Jesus. Okay, so let's look at passages like Romans 11 that says, Lest you be wise in your own sight. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved, as it is written. <coughs> the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. I interpret this to mean that at the end, towards the end, there's going to be revival in Israel. God is going to do a work in Israel to bring people back to Him. Not back to the old covenant, not back to become a better Jew, but into the church. By church definition, those who believe in Jesus. That's what He's going to do. Um, is God going to do this because they are such a wonderful nation? Oh, they are so lovely. No, He's doing it in spite of them. God is going to do it so that the world goes, how can a God treat an unholy nation so well? And we say, let me tell you about my God of grace. Let me tell you about my God of love, who in spite of those people, still did this for them. I didn't even have to go to the Jews for that. I can go to myself for that. How can God still love you, Coral J? I know you. Let me tell you about my God, who is far more gracious than I deserve. So God will still do a work in Israel, not because they're great, but because He is great. So the first wrong view is to think that God is done with Israel. The second wrong view is that we are done with Israel. So becoming anti-Israel. This is the group that becomes so disillusioned by Christian Zionism that they become anti-Israel. <coughs> this is wrong because we are called to make disciples of all nations and it includes Israel. You can't save someone you hate. You can't save someone you hate. You can't reach them with the love of God if you hate them. Don't hate Israel. Don't hate Palestine. We need to reach them through kindness and love and truth. I want to ask you this. In the way that you've been discussing this at your Bible studies or with your friends or with people, if an unbelieving Jewish person had to be in that group unbeknownst to you, through that discussion, would they want to love your Jesus and accept Him and follow Him? Now ask the same question if a Palestinian guy had to stand in that group and you didn't know it, the way that you discussed the war. With this Palestinian person here, God loves you. He's got a plan for you. He wants to save you. And I'm sorry to say, in the way that some people talk about it, that is not true. Palestinians would want nothing to do with your God in the way that you speak. Now, same for Israel if you become anti-Israel. Okay, so in conclusion... Um, I hope I helped you to understand the other side better. I hope I helped you to understand that there are people who disagree with me on biblical terms and they also have the same God and the same goal. And what might now happen is that you tell me, Coral J, that's all good and well, but my side is wrong. Yours, my side is right. You know, all good people agree with me. 
Whenever I go on YouTube or Facebook or Twitter, I just see vi videos everyone is agreeing with me. They all agree with me. Your side is wrong. All that tells me is that you don't understand social media algorithms. All that tells me. You know how social media algorithms work? If you watch one video, and especially if you like it or send it on, the algorithm says, this person has this view. Give him more of that view and keep all other views away. Why? Because what's going to happen if you suddenly get a video that's completely the other side? You're going to stop watching and they're going to lose money. They will keep on giving you what you want to see, what you want, and eventually you think, oh, everyone agrees with me. See, I am right. And it's actually just your sources that you listen to. And you don't do the effort to go listen to the other side. I hope I helped you today to listen to the other side. Um, because I want to say this again. In God's true church of born again, Bible believing, spirit filled, Jesus following, Christ honoring, you name it, church of people, there are people who say yes and no to that answer. Why can we coexist? Why is this a thing that we can happily disagree on? Maybe not so happy for some of you, but still disagree on, but still love and work together. Because it doesn't have to interfere with what we call to do on a daily basis. On a daily basis, you call to do this. Love God, love people, make disciples. That's what you call to do. Love God, love people, make disciples. Now, I don't think there's anyone here who's a missionary to Israel. If you are or planning to be, let's pray for you. I'm, I'm very excited. I don't think there's anyone here who's a missionary to Palestine. If you are, please come. We want to pray for you. We're excited about you going. You know what that means? I'm not supposed to spend all my time thinking about Israel and Palestine. I'm planted here. This is my mission field. These are the people that God cares that I should care about. And Satan, if Satan can get you to sit home all day and just watch video troop after video troop, reinforcing your view, reinforcing you, and around you your neighbors are going to hell, Satan is one. You are welcome your view. Have your view. But I hope one primary part of your view is, I need to make disciples in Stilby. I need to go out and reach people with the love and the truth of Jesus here, right now. Doesn't matter if they are Jew or Palestine or Khoza or Afrikaans. Even Afrikaans people need to be saved. Um, that's a whole other sermon. Um, that's what we are here for. That's our focus. To go, ask yourself: has, Have you ever explained the gospel to your neighbor? Does your neighbor know that there's a God who created the universe and he's the boss of it? Does your neighbor know and he's heard it from you that all humans are sinners and it separates us from God and we have no chance to ever stand before him at the end and explain our way into, the, into eternity and, and convince God that we're not as bad as he says? No. Have you, ex have you ever told your neighbor that there's only one way and it's Jesus? Told him the excitement of a Jesus who came died, rose again, ruling in the heavens today, that you can go to Him today and have your sins forgiven and made new, and that you can go and live with Him for eternity. Does your neighbors know this? I care far more about that than I care about your opinion about Israel. Because that's what we call to. Let's pray together. Lord, I want to ask, by, ask forgiveness for the times when we elevate ourselves due to our opinions above others. Lord, when we get our truth from places that's not you. Lord, today we want to pray for Israel. We want to pray for a nation that by and large does not know you. And Lord, there's not a third way. There's only for Jesus and against Jesus. So, Lord, we pray for Israel to be saved. Lord, we pray for missionaries to go out and, and tell the good news of Jesus to the Israelites. Lord, but we pray the same for Palestine. Lord, how many people have died now that never had a chance to hear? And we're not here to talk politics. But, Lord, give people another chance. Send the missionary in. Bring someone there. Bring them to the truth. Lord, 
that is our desire for people to be saved. Give us a heart for Israel. Give us a heart for Palestine. Give us a heart for Russia and Ukraine and South Africa, but specifically South Africa. Because this is where you planted us. This is where you've called us on a mission to make disciples. And so, Lord, help us to fulfill your calling on our lives and to accept those who disagree with us, to live together in peaceful, joyful unity with you at the center. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. People here who needed to hear that. And I want you to go think about it. Um, because there are people on both sides who are very unloving towards the other side. Um, there are people that if you just mention something about Israel and you're not glorifying Israel, they get all shaky. They say it's very good to find out what your idol is. It's the thing you get upset at when people touch it. Be careful that Israel doesn't become your idol. Be careful that anti-Israel doesn't become your idol. Let Jesus be our God. Let's follow Him. Let's follow Him. He is the way, the truth, and the light. Let's receive the blessing from the Lord. Now to Him, who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to Him be the glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. I hope you were blessed in hearing God's word today. For more information or prayer, please visit our website stillbaybaptist.co.za. May you find your life in Jesus Christ and Him alone.